Welcome to Norse Code, the number one podcast for your Minnesota Vikings. I am your host and producer. My name is James Pagoshnik. Thank you so much for listening. And on the other end of the tin can and string, we have our uh, analyst. We have our co-host. You know him as the useful human, Arif Hassan. Arif, how are you doing? I'm good, man. How are you? I am exhausted. I am... <laughs> I, I had to do that thing when driving home where you're blasting music and having to sing along loudly to uh, to make sure that you don't fall asleep and you know, kill yourself or someone else. Got like, some good Kesha in there. You know, there wasn't a lot of Kesha. Sadly, it was uh, it was more gin blossoms, which is, you know, going to date me quite a bit. But hey, hey jealousy. jealousy. Hey, jealousy yeah. is a like a top five sing along in the car like 90s song, like a great great song to just to, to shout it out to and uh there was some semi-sonic in there there was some dan wilson underrated song to sing along to for that though is uh, is the uh, uh a song can be about anything from the dan wilson uh record not the new one but the one before that like that's that's about as broody uh, as he gets was, was it called freestyle is that what his, his like first solo is uh no free life was the first free life one. that's it yeah yeah, yeah. Had the right idea yeah yep yeah. But uh, yeah, it's just it's just a fantastic. Uh, uh, it's a great song to to yell. <laughs> it's just it's it's, a, it's a, like the most moody he ever gets. So it's like the most upset Dan Wilson song ever. Uh, but yeah, I'm. I, it's been a long, long day, and uh, we're gonna have uh, we're gonna have a lot of fun here talking about uh, the Bucks game. We have plenty of questions in the mailbag for you guys, and. Uh, yeah, let's uh, let's get started by just reminding you guys quickly that we are sponsored by you. We are brought to you by you, the listener. If you enjoy the show, uh, feel free to go on the iTunes and give us five stars. Tell us you like us. Tell us you don't like us. Make some sort of joke about the show. It's not for our ego. Ego. It's just trying to keep the uh, uh, just trying to drive the show up the charts a little bit. If you would like to do more, uh, you can certainly do so by going to uh, paypal.me slash Norse code. You can donate there if you'd like to help keep the lights on. Uh, throw a couple of bucks our way. We appreciate it. You can also go, if you're feeling even more generous, you can go to patreon.com slash Norse code and you can become a, a sustaining member, a bit like an NPR pledge drive where you're donating per month. Uh, again, we, we appreciate anything that you guys are willing to throw at us. We are going to London this year. Just a reminder, we will be doing a live uh, to tape show <laughs> with uh, with Eric from uh, with Eric Thompson from the Daily Norseman. Uh, it'll be Dusty, Arif and Eric. And we're hoping to do at least one show. Possibly two shows out there. Uh, a pregame. It should be great. Yeah, yeah, this it should be great. Yeah, Dusty's excited. Arif's excited. Eric has been pimping the show out to people at the, in the stands at uh, at Vikings games. Like this should be really cool. I cannot wait to uh, to listen and put this together. I'm very jealous that I will not be uh, joining you, but I have to uh, stay and work an event with Ryan Leaf. So, I mean, oh, yeah. So you're going to be having the time of your life. We'll be like, <laughs> oh, man, I wish we could hang out with Ryan Leaf and ask him about where all the best places are to get cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to know, do you take it? Do you take the cocaine before or after you take the downers? Like, it, does it depend on like the, the, the chase time on this? Like, what's the best way to it's going to be great. Um, I am actually looking forward to that. Um uh, piece of work by the way but uh yeah so we were we we're going to london it's going to be great anything you guys uh, can throw our way will will help uh we are looking forward to providing those shows to you which podcasts are going to london for you come on it is norse code demand excellence demand norse code uh, a couple things to just mention uh, before we do the show. Uh, the challenge, I don't believe Dusty brought up the challenge l last episode, did he? Uh, the uh, the title Town Sound Off? Yes. Uh, yeah, he did bring it up. Uh, he mentioned that we lost, I believe. Yeah. Um, I'm bringing it up because it appears that right. it doesn't look like there's a lot of people that, that hurt, listened to the last show because of the odd structure of his, when we released it. Thank right, you, right. Laptop Fire. Uh, but right. <laughs> uh, but we did end up losing the uh, we did end up losing the contest. We will be donating money uh, to Title Town Sounds uh, 
charity. Uh, which charity was that again? Uh, it was uh, an Alzheimer's charity. I forget which player it's associated with. That's I wanted right, to say that's right. wanted to say Clay Matthews, but I'm pretty sure it's not because I think he has a, a degenerative muscle disease uh, charity of some sort. So it's probably not his, but yeah. some some Green Bay Packers Alzheimer's Foundation. Yep, we uh, we held strong to the fir- to the uh, throughout the first half, and then in the second half, it all just kind of fell apart. So it is the story of the Vikings and Green Bay, I suppose. Uh, but kudos to them. Congratulations. We will be donating money to their uh, to their group. So all things, all promotional things taken care of. We have one heck of a uh, of a butt kicking to talk about, and the thing that everyone is talking about now that the Bucks game is finished is about how Kai Forbath made all of his extra points, all yeah, of them. Kai Forbath, the hero, Kai of Forbath, the game, obviously, money. He is money out there. He's not as money as the Eagles kicker, mind man, you, but he I is God, money. Don't do, man. Okay, so here's my thing. 61 yard kick, right? All all Carson Wentz has to do is is complete a 19 yard pass. Misses the other two, by the way. Completes a 19 yard pass after a touchback. So the only impetus for the offense was a 19 yard pass to Alshon Jeffrey, who saves him, right? All the other passes to Alshon Jeffrey didn't work out, right? 19 yard pass, 61 yard kick, like the longest field goal completed since I think 2009. And now Carson Wentz gets a game-winning drive tally in his column. Threw for 5.7 yards per attempt. I think 5.6 before that pass. But yards per attempt is something that people care about, isn't it? Yeah, obviously, right? You know, when, when, they, when they talk about, you know, when the Eagles, maybe they get to the playoffs, right? Because the Cowboys are playing like crap. The Giants are bad. Uh, Washington, I've never believed in them. When the Eagles, like, maybe make the playoffs, right? People are going to talk about how Carson Wentz Brought, in, brought them to the playoffs. Doesn't matter what his yards per attempt was. Doesn't matter that the Eagles' defense is generating an insane turnover differential. They're, I think they're number two in DVOA. Right, a fantastic Eagles defense. Fletcher Cox, Malcolm Jenkins, uh, Chris Long, evidently. Um, great defense. Doesn't matter. Carson Wentz, 5.7 yards per attempt. Leads him to the playoffs. Doesn't matter. He's going to throw like 21 interceptions. He'll have a couple of touchdowns and some wins. Thanks, by the way, for that, uh, yeah, for bringing that up. I was, that. I was just going to say, you all. it sounds like to me you're just waiting for, uh, you're just living for the moment for Carson Wentz to end up in the playoffs and be exposed, but I don't even think that's going to make you happy. No, it's not. And, you know, the thing is, he's probably not going, because, I mean, it's not a, it's not a good quarterback, right? He's got a pretty decent cast. Uh, you know, Alshon Jeffrey, Torrey Smith, maybe they could do better individually as players, but he's got a pretty decent cast. The defense is so good. And it's gonna take it's gonna take them there, and I'm just maybe, maybe the Cowboys can it can put it back together. Maybe Washington, you know, kind of, you know, they 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 put one on the Raiders. Maybe Washington is gonna bring it home. Chris, they've got two really good running backs and a third one I like. Maybe I don't know, man. This has been another episode of baiting a reef into an argument about Carson Wentz. I, I argued with myself, so you didn't even have to bait me into an argument with you. It was ah. perfect. <laughs> it worked so well. Because <laughs> the only person who's going to beat you is you, and I think you did. Yeah. So, congratulations. So upset. So, um, now that we have that out of the way, uh, Case Keenum is the owner of Tampa Bay. Like, I'm pretty sure he owns the entirety of the county. Yeah, uh, I think he's 4-0 against them. Yeah, it's it's ridiculous. Has Case. a 131 passer rating against them. I think seven touchdowns, one interception, maybe six, one interception. <laughs> the man, the man did work. Why was uh, Case Keenum successful? And did it have anything to do with the uh, with the Adam Thielen catch early in the game? I think that helps. So there's, I think, a lot of things that help. I think the first one is that so Case Keenum is an inherently aggressive quarterback. He doesn't have like a ton of you know, uh, you know, arm strength, but he's a very aggressive quarterback. Goes back to his time in Houston, showed a little bit of it in St. Louis. And then like, I guess in Minnesota, like in the preseason and training camp, we saw a lot of it. He was just unleashing the ball. And Minnesota has a bunch of really good deep ball trackers. Adam Thielen, who works from both the outside and the slot and Stefan Diggs, both really, really good at the act of securing the ball after, you know, it's, it, it's been released, which I know like sounds like the receiver's job, but it's a unique skill set at part of the catch process. Adam Thielen's catch early, I think, gave the Vikings uh, the, uh, I guess, confidence. It's a, it's a word that's a little bit overused in sports, but 
the confidence to keep calling those deep shots in case Keenum was more than happy to take them. So I think that that early Adam Thielen catch had a lot to do with it. And he, I mean, it wasn't a very accurate throw. He had to like veer inside, but he had stacked the defensive back and prevented the defensive back from getting access to the ball. So he created like this exclusive real estate for himself and he used it really well. He tried on multiple occasions to overthrow his receivers. Like it, there were a few throws out there that it almost looked like Diggs and Thielen specifically were having to jump about three and a half feet up in the air just to ha- be like be able to get any part of it. It seemed like he was trying really hard to uh, to overthrow a couple of those guys. But man, what a uh, what a successful day, especially for Diggs. Yeah, right. What was it, 173 yards, two touchdowns? And you knew what was going to him. Like, it's, even when the third quarter, when the Bucks were starting to come back a bit, you knew that every time that there was a drop back, he wanted to go for digs. I've been joking with friends on uh, I Have the New Madden, and every time I see digs with one defender on him and the safety nowhere near him to pick up the second i just know okay well i guess i'm just gonna audible here to a to a to a just a long bomb to digs because he's gonna get it and it felt like that during the game like it just felt like digs was was unstoppable that if he had only one guy on him it was it wasn't gonna matter it was already his and he was already gonna be running to the end zone yeah and i think a big part of it actually had to do with dalvin cook i think that Generally speaking, analysts overvalue the impact the running game has on receivers, and I've mentioned in the past that Adrian Peterson doesn't always do a really good job of bringing an extra defender into the box. A lot of it has to do with like the formation. Um, but you know, as Mike Zimmer mentioned that the running success that they have with Delvin Cook w- uh, forced the safety into a box and allowed them to get single coverage. And I think a lot of that, you know, also has to do with you know the way the Vikings run routes. You know, it's it's probably better to go into cover three than cover two against some of these routes because they don't. Uh, run up the seam all that much. I mean, the Vikings just don't do that that often, and so uh, cover three is sometimes better. Plus, it puts another safety in the box. And you know, the Vikings are very aggressive about having two tight ends or one tight end and a fullback out there. So they also schemed, you know, uh, eight man or nine man bo- boxes. And so I think a lot of it has to do with the way that the Vikings manipulated the defense, and a lot of it has to do with you know Devin Cook was having a really good game, and so it allowed them uh, to to force the Buccaneers into single coverage. And, you know, single coverage, especially if you can get, I mean, because there was a lot of play action in the game. Case Keenum may have thrown more play action passes than anybody since, like, the Gary Kubiak Texans. It was right? crazy. Like, like every yeah. time he dropped back. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that helps a lot. It opens up the middle uh, because the linebackers bite. And, you know, Case Keenum's got a lot of flaws, but he can sell play action pretty well. Um, and so, yeah, you know, it, it opened up the middle a little bit, drew the linebackers in, so it gave you the crossing routes to Theon and Diggs. And even when it didn't, like, and, you know, the cornerbacks, you know, in, in that scheme, they've got a little bit of, of of run coverage, you know, requirements because very often the Bucks want to be in cover two. And so they'll they'll put their cornerbacks into a situation where they have to do run defense. And uh, in, in that case, you know, play action does give them a little bit more room. Boom, goes to Diggs. It was really good. I think a good game from Pat Shermer. Obviously a good game from Case Keenum. And a fantastic game from both Diggs and Thielen. I think also it should be mentioned that offensive line did a really good job, it, it, especially of all people, you know, Mike Rammers. I mean, who would have thought? Yeah, the offensive line held it together. Uh, I believe, and I, I could be wrong here, that there were no sacks on uh, on Keenum. And was he only touched like two or three times? Yeah, there were only two hits. So, you yeah. know, uh, I, I asked PFF to give me the stats after the game. Me and PFF got a cozy relationship. Actually, what happens is they've got media people assigned to each beat, so uh, it was really easy to get them. But uh, don't don't undersell this connection that only Norse Code seems to have. <laughs> right. Uh, so Riley Reef gave up only one hurry. Nick Easton gave up one hit. Pat Ufflin, a little bit, little bit of weak game for him. Two hits, one hurry. Joe Berger, one hurry. Mike Remmers, no pressure at all. So what ends up happening, you know, of course. You've only got, you know, three, four, five, six, seven. You've only got seven pressures the entire game. They drop back quite a bit. Uh, seven pressures, and, you know, Keenum did a little bit better under pressure in this game than he did in the last game. When you've got so few passes under pressure, plus you're doing pretty well under pressure versus, you know, how you usually do, the game ends up looking a lot better. 
Trevor Sikama, the guest from uh, from the Thursday, or sorry, from the Friday show, uh, had tweeted out earlier this evening that uh, man, even when the Bucks got to Keenum, the dude was not phased at all. He Seems was, a little unusual given like how he was reacting in the Steelers game, but yeah, absolutely, Sikama's right, <laughs> unfazed. Also, if you've not had a chance to listen to that episode, uh, it is a really, really good one. Uh, it I. <laughs> during the uh, during the time when I had to record after the the show, I spent quite a bit of time listening to that. Is a great breakdown between the two of you. Although, admittedly, he is uh, he was a bit higher on Mike Evans than he uh, had any right to be in the matchup. Of it, it turns out, I, I tried to give him an out. I was like, look at all of these number one receivers who have done really poorly against Xavier Rhodes. They get fifty to seventy five percent of what they normally do, and he's like, no, but. But he was like, well, if that means that the Vikings put him in single coverage and rotate a safety on top of Deshaun Jackson, then they're going to go to him a lot. And admittedly, they did target Mike Evans quite a bit, but not as much as they very often do. Uh, and a lot of it had to do with how good Xavier Rhodes was. So I understand, Trevor, but you, you, didn't, you didn't take the wiggle room I gave you. You could have taken it. <laughs> Roads closed, uh, and we'll get we'll be getting to the defense here in uh, in just a little bit. But we're not done talking about how well our offense did. So uh, the the question I want to ask, and it's it's a popular question, is how much of our success on offense had to do with the fact their team was dropping like flies? You know, I think a fair amount, and it's not. I don't think that this is necessarily an excuse. It's just kind of like another point of analysis because you know it's not like the vikings have their own injury whereas they had a backup quarterback in there so it's not to say the vikings aren't as good as they look because look at all these injuries but it does indicate a the bucks going forward will probably look a lot better and b you know we should take some of the performances of some of these individual players so you know offensive linemen moving up to the next level uh both Diggs and thielen you know i don't think they're going to average 173 yards a game going forward uh with maybe just a grain of salt right because brent grimes was injured before the game you know, their starting nose tackle was injured before the game. And then, of course, you know, some of their best players were injured during the game. You know, we saw Levante David, I think he got injured. Right, it was Levante David. Uh, and then Gerald McCoy got injured twice. You know, he he's injured once, had to go out of the game. A couple of snaps, came back in, was injured again. That happened a little bit later, admittedly. But, you know, they had a lot of injuries on defense. And, you know, credit to the Vikings, they took advantage of it. You have to. Injuries happen in football games. And, if you know, if you don't take advantage of it as a team that's relatively you know, kept clean, again, they're with their backup quarterback, then then you're not a good team. But the Vikings did what good teams do in that situation, and they took advantage uh, of some of the injury weaknesses that occurred. You know, the Vikings, obviously, they're not a very dirty team. Um, but, you know, when those injuries occur, you have to take advantage of them. Yeah, it was a uh, – it was interesting to, to watch – just how many people were going out, you know, uh, especially when uh, when Gerald McCoy just kept going out. Yeah, no, that's that's tough. I mean, he's their best player. I mean, like you like you know Vernon Hargreaves and Levante David a lot, uh, and I think was it Quan Alexander was injured uh, before the game too. Um, you know, those are all really good players. They've got really good players at every level of the defense, uh, and you know, two of their two of their best uh, players were injured before the game. Two of their four best players were injured before the game, and then those other two players got injured during the game. Plus. Vernon Hargreaves, in addition to Brent Grimes, got injured. So, like, I think Vernon Hargreaves got injured anyway. So, uh, that, I mean, that created a lot of problems. And, and it, you know, it gave the Vikings an opening that they took full advantage of. Completely. Uh, so, Diggs and Thielen, are they the best wide receiver tandem in the league? You know, that's a pretty good question. I was thinking about this. And I, I, my first uh, instinct was to be like, well, no. Right? Because they're both clearly top 20 receivers, and they're both making a case to be top 10 receivers, which puts you in this like conversation where you're like, well, maybe, because how many teams have two top 10 receivers? And you think about it, and you go, well, who are the top receivers in the league? You go, A.J. Green. I like John Ross, but he's injured. He's not. He's probably not good enough to be cons- to be to to put them over the edge. And it's not as if, you know, uh, Brandon LaFell is going to put the Bengals over the edge. So probably not the Bengals. Well, who else? Well, Julio. Well, Julio's really good. Who's their second receiver? Mohamed Sanu. I mean, Sanu is fine. He's a pretty good number two receiver. I don't think he's better than either of them. I would put the Atlanta Falcons in the maybe scenario, right? Um, so, you know, maybe the Atlanta Falcons. Well, who, who's the other best receiver in the league? Antonio Brown. Well, they're with Martavis Bryant. So I would say that group is above 
above the Thielen and Diggs group as a pair. And then I'm thinking Edelman and Cooks and Demaryius Thomas and Emmanuel Sanders. Those two definitely have, I think, a better argument than Julio and Sanu. Um, but I want to say, I want to say that Julio is just so good. He's my, I think he's the top receiver in the league. I used to argue with Antonio Brown, and I've done a lot more thinking about it, and I've run a lot more numbers, uh, and I think it's Julio. And one of the things about the way I run these numbers is I, 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 I do this thing where I evaluate receivers by yards per, per route run, which is, I think, the most predictive form of analysis for receivers for when they switch teams, and the most predictive form of analysis in terms of how they contribute to wins. Uh, and I run a regression that allows you to eliminate the, uh, the performance of the quarterback because, you know, what's going to be the biggest, uh, you know, outlier, what's going to be the biggest external variable that impacts yards per run is going to be the quality of the quarterback. So Julio Jones leads the league in yards per out run. Well, I mean, Matt Ryan led the league in yards per attempt. So, you know, who knows? But I, I ran a regression that eliminated the quarterback or the correlation between yards per out run and, and team quarterback yards per attempt was, was zero. And Julio, he, the difference between Julio and Antonio was number two and Antonio and like the number 16 receiver was the same. Like the, the, the gap was huge. So even though Mohamed Sanu is not as good as either Dix or Thielen, I think by any reasonable stretch of the imagination, I'd probably put the Atlanta Falcons number one just because of how good their number one is. I'd put the Pittsburgh Steelers number two because Antonio and, and Martavis Bryant, I think are better than Stefan Diggs and Adam Thielen. And then after that, I think the next three, you could have a really good conversation, right? Manuel Sanders, Demarius Thomas, uh, Julian Edelman, Brandon Cooks. They're probably above, right? But uh, there's a really good conversation to be had about about whether or not they're like the third or fourth or fifth. And keep in mind who's throwing to them. You know, you look at uh, well, you look at the the the, uh, the New England combination there, and go well. You have Tom Brady, who is still able to throw five touchdown games, including the the one that just happened with uh, with the Texans. And then you go, well, all of this is being accomplished with two backup quarterbacks, Bradford and uh, and Case Keenum. Like this is this is pretty impressive stuff they're putting up either way. Yeah, I think if you just look at it in terms of like total receiving yards, I think the two of them are number one. And like, yeah, it's like. You know, they had Case Keenum for two games. What? <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, well, you know, Brandon Cooks is putting up all these numbers. Julian Edelman's putting up all these numbers. And, of course, he's got Brady. Oh, Diggs is putting up these numbers. Oh, yeah, he's got Case Keenum throwing to him, right, for two weeks straight. Oh, and there's another 170-yard game. Oh, well, why not? Uh, Dalvin Cook. Great game. Uh 97 yards uh, rushing and quite a bit on uh, on the pass as well. Is he quietly the second best rookie running back in the league? Or is he making an argument for something more? I think right now you can put him at number two. Um, I mean, Kareem Hunt is performing at the supernatural level. And even if you took away Kareem Hunt's like 60-yard touchdown, uh, which Bill Barnwell argues occurred in garbage time, it is difficult to make the argument that it was garbage time, but he 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 justifies it, right? Because they were only up by seven when he when he scores the sixty yard touchdown. Well, in, in garbage but, time, garbage time typically refers to anything that happens like over the pass, like it's right. Yeah, no, exactly, right. But what they really needed to do was to get a first down and then kneel it out. So I get his argument, right? That like scoring was actually worse for them because it gave the other team the ball back than. Uh, you know, getting past the down marker and then kneeling it out. So I get what his argument is, but it's not as if, you know, they weren't trying to stop them. I mean, because they were trying to win the game, right? So they're, they're clearly going to try and stop the run. So I get his argument. But even if you even if you believe that argument, which I'm not, I don't really believe. But even if you take away a 60-yard touchdown, he's been having great game after great game after great game. So I'm going to give it to Kareem Hunt. Uh, he is a super interesting specimen because of the way that he... Uh, you know, tears off tacklers and, and gets yards after contact and stuff like that. He's not the fastest rookie running back. And, you know, really, honestly, neither is Dalvin Cook. Um, but they're clearly the two of them are clearly, you know, the biggest threats uh, among the rookies. Uh, that, you know, it's it's fascinating. And, you know, with 13 games left to go, I mean, Dalvin Cook could very easily pull ahead of Kareem Hunt. Uh, and, like, Hunt is having, like, three games in a row where you're like, well, those are outlier performances. He's averaging, like, eight yards a carry or whatever. Um, but, you know, at this point, you kind of have to trust, you know, what he's doing. 
Um, but yeah, you know, Dalvin Cook, you know, any most years, I think he'd be, you know, offensive rookie of the year. Right now, he's got kind of an unusual amount of competition. Now, no one is comparing him to Adrian Peterson while literally showing a graphic comparing them. But if we were to compare the process, <laughs> what? I, I, how do you even say that on broadcast and not like realize halfway through that you're saying something stupid? Well, like, I mean, you're setting up <laughs> these enormous expectations. But the broadcast comparison, in fairness, the argument that they were making, Dalvin Cook does have more rushing yards through three games than Adrian Peterson did. Now, mind you, in order to keep that up, Dalvin Cook's going to have to put together a 300-yard game between now and the next three games. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, like, you know. Look, looking forward to that. Let's just, let me just say, <laughs> looking forward to that. Um, but at least Dalvin Cook provides a greater variety of skills that you can draw upon. I'll, I'll finish there. <laughs> We're not literally comparing him to Adrian Peterson. No one would do that, not even with a graphic on the screen. That would be foolish. Um, but. <laughs> but. So, the defense of of the Bucks should have been able to handle Cook better than he did. Why was Cook so successful out there? Was it the O-line? Was it just, like, the route he was taking? Or was it the aggressiveness uh, of the offensive coordinator? Yeah, I, I'm going to have to take a second look at the film. I'm going to have to do another pass. But, you know, my initial impression was that I think the offensive line did a better job getting to the second level than they did, obviously, against the Steelers, or they did even in the first game. Uh, and I think getting to the second level, closing off those linebackers, Kendall Beckwith, Levante David for a while, um, was a big part of, you know, how Dalvin Cook did well. Uh, you know, those first two runs were big successes, but I think a lot of it has to just do with, you know, Dalvin Cook himself. Uh, even, even runs where he only got one yard, he put together, like, a supernatural effort. You know, he was able to shed tacklers in the backfield and do a really good job of you know, getting those yards after contact, creating missed tackles, and, and making sure that the offense can at least remain on schedule as opposed to sort of in a panic mode on second and 15 or, or third and, or, and eight, right? So you know, I think he did a really good job of just powering through tackles, moving piles. Again, not something that you typically associate with him. Uh, and, he was, and he was able to get those extra yards. And I think halfway through the game, you know, someone was like, well, hold on. He's only got like you know, 2.8 yards a carry, 2.9 yards a carry. You know, he he's probably not performing that well. And you, and you think about, like, each of the individual runs, and it's like, well, even the one-yard runs, he's doing well. And a lot of it, he's running a lot of times on third and one and uh, on goal and short. When I finally run the success rate numbers, I suspect they'll be very positive. Um, so, yeah, he did a lot to, to make sure that the offense was kept on schedule. What do you think was the... Uh the reason why Shermer was so aggressive this game. It seemed like we were taking more shots and uh, going for more home runs with uh, with this game than anything else. Well, I think some of it actually has to do with Case Keenum. I think Case Keenum just inherently, his first read is the deep shot. Doesn't matter what defense they're in. You know, single <laughs> he's, high, got some of that, he's got some of that Rex Grossman uh, yes. to, to sprinkle with, on. With, he's going deep. Without the dragon. <laughs> no no dragon to be unleashed here unless you live in Tampa Bay. Right, right, unless you live in Tampa Bay. But like his first read, regardless of whether or not it makes sense, is probably the deep shot. He loves taking it. If he thinks there's a shadow of that guy being open, right, he'll throw the corner out against cover two because that's what you're supposed to do, even though he doesn't have the arm for it, right? So like... He just wants it I so think badly. A lot of it, yeah, right. He's just like, well, 20 yards is obviously better than eight. Why are we even debating this? Let's go. <laughs> my, all my checkdowns are 20 yards or more. <laughs> this is why you should start me instead of Bradford. See that? Another 20 yards. I don't care that Diggs had like six guys on him and he had to jump 12 feet in the air to catch it. 20 yards is 20 yards. 20 yards is 20 yards. Those are my checkdowns, damn it. Yeah, so I don't think Shermer called a necessarily more aggressive game than he did against the Steelers, or you know, in the in the first game. Uh, I, I just think that he called a lot of the same plays, uh, but but Keenum is just an inherently aggressive quarterback. Inherently aggressive, I like it. Uh, so our defense feasted on stolen crab this Sunday, um, leading to the question: <laughs> Mike Evans, who? Yeah, right. Speaking of feasting, 
Uh, Xavier Rhodes goes to a as of yet unnamed restaurant. Uh, we we both desperately want it to be Manny's because that would be perfect. It's gotta be Manny's. It's gotta be uh, Manny's. And they honored him by serving him uh, two cakes. I, I believe one cheesecake, one chocolate cake, if I remember. And in chocolate uh, was written Mike Evans who. They clearly paid attention to what happened. <laughs> so what happens when you ball out. Uh, Xavier Rhodes was targeted nine times. I think it's in your show notes. It allowed four receptions uh, with a pass defended. Um, so, uh, yeah, he did a really good job. He only gave up, I want to say, 23 yards. Uh, I, can, I can pull it up real quick. Uh, this is also included in uh, in my email to PFF. Oh, yeah, your, your BFF, PFF, I forgot. Right. Uh, targeted seven times, allowed four catches for 52 yards. No, that's Trey Wayne, sorry. Targeted nine times, four catches, 36 yards, and had a pass defended. Uh, and so he gave a, a, a pass rating of below 60. Uh, so, yeah, really, really good game. Uh, what about the penalties on him this, uh, this game? Uh, you know, he was flagged for defensive holding. holding. It was declined. Uh, and and he was flagged for taunting, which he wasn't targeted on that play. I I get it because it occurred, like, well after the play was over. I felt like it was responsive to, you know, what the Bucks were doing. But it's not like I would say he made the wrong call to the ref. I just think that most refs maybe initially wouldn't have thrown the flag. But that, that could just be my bias. Um, so that actually, that was a pretty... Uh, substantial penalty. And that's, you know, kind of why, you know, people are taking a look at PFF's grades and they're like, wait a sec, why is Rhodes graded so low? And, you know, they asked that question two years ago. It's because of the penalties. Uh, and that's, I think, fair. I, I, I'm i okay taking, like, one penalty against Mike Evans uh, because that's just going to happen, you know, through a physical game. That taunting penalty, a little bit much. It does show Xavier Rhodes' confidence, but I think his overall impact on the game is still significantly better than, you know, whatever his PFF grade is, uh, which is still relatively low. Yeah. So, yeah, he had two penalties in the game. One was declined. Um, and, you know, the other one was was a fairly substantial one. But still, great game. And as a result of the penalties, uh, the top-rated corner for the Vikings this particular game was Trey Waynes? Really? Yeah, right? What's happening? What's happening? I don't... So he, he was, yeah. So according to PFF, he was targeted seven times and only allowed four catches. I think... PFF didn't count a lot of those underneath zones as his targets. And so I, I actually, I think that he didn't play as well as PFF is saying he did. And, you know, hey, oh, God, Arif is saying that Trey Waynes didn't play well. Like, oh, I got to believe that. Um, but, you know, people were complaining about how Trey Waynes was playing all up until that point, until he got that interception. And, obviously, like, I don't want to ignore it. That was actually a really good play. Um, but I want to say that, like, it, when you're projecting play going forward, you want to see, hey, can he prevent first downs? And Trey Wayne currently leads the league in first downs allowed in coverage. I mean, that's one of the things I asked BFF about. Uh, and so it's not as if his overall impact over these three games has been positive. It's not as if I think that you can... Because, you know, I, I know a lot of people, I was talking to some people, and I know a lot of people think that, like, well, if he's in off coverage, that's just, a, that's just what the defense is calling. And, you know, it's not his fault. But, like, A, no defensive coordinator is going to call off coverage on third and short. It just doesn't happen. B, I do know, based on my discussions with members of the Vikings, that the quarterbacks are given a lot of free reign about whether or not they're going to roll up, whether or not they're in off coverage. They have to make this decision based on whether or not, A, they've got help over top, right? So, you know, if it's it's cover two, they know they've got help over top. They're, they should be more comfortable pressing. Um, B, you know, sort of the receiver they're up against, what they see on film. See, you know, whether or not it's zone or man, you know, it's a little bit more difficult to press in zone. Uh, and D, sort of like how the quarterback plays. Because if it's a, you know, more freestyle quarterback, you know, disrupting their timing is not going to matter as much. You know, so they, they've got a lot of, like, options uh, over, over whether or not they're going to run, you know, press or off. And whether or not they're going to be three yards off or seven yards off or ten yards off. Davey Rope does an off coverage a lot. And he allowed a lot of first downs. Not as much as in that Pittsburgh game. But I do think sort of going forward... Hey, you know, he's got the interception. And I actually, I don't even want to give, you know, I don't want to make those excuses that a couple of people are making about that interception, right? Like, they're saying, well, it was an underthrown ball. And I get that, like, you know, it's not as good as if he had intercepted, like, a perfect pass. But, like, the job of a defensive back is to create really difficult throwing windows. And that's what he did. He created a throwing window where 
He couldn't place it on Deshaun Jackson or behind Deshaun Jackson. He had to place it ahead of Deshaun Jackson. He didn't. Trey Wentz took advantage of it. So I'll give him credit for that. And I fully recognize that, you know, had Deshaun Jackson had better ball placement, he'd scored a touchdown. You know, we'd probably be criticizing Trey Wayne's for that, even though he wouldn't have to play any differently for that. But I think sort of you need to recognize that in a lot of these situations that creating those tight throwing windows is the best a defensive back can do. And the quarterback's job is to place it outside of that tight throwing window. And he didn't. And Trey Wayne's took advantage of it, got an interception, credit to him. So... Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't want to say his interception wasn't that good. I want to say that the context of his play in the game still gives rise to some questions about whether or not he'll be, you know, effective going forward. But the Vikings, I think, they're not only going to roll with him, but I think they're going to be correct rolling with him uh, in the next game because you know confidence is a big part of of this whole you know cornerback affair. So we'll see. You know, he had uh, an excellent passer rating. PFF rated him very high. Um, I think that some of the things that they didn't credit to him should go to him. And so his game is not as good as BFF is saying, but he's fully earned based off of his play, you know, a couple more chances. So uh, another thing I want to mention was just the sheer number of sacks and hits that we had on, uh, uh, on Jameis Winston. It didn't look like he was comfortable at any point during the game. Like even the uh, even in the third quarter when they were driving and attempting to catch up, we were still just smacking them around quite a bit. Yeah, there were a couple of sacks and a couple more quarterback hits. Uh, Everson Griffin again did a really good job. Uh, I think he ended up with a quarterback hit as well as a sack, uh, as well as a couple of pressures besides. Uh, and so that gives him, I believe, three and a half sacks for the year so far. Uh, the fourth play in which he's been credited uh, with participating in a sack. He's having a monstrously good game. Uh, Daniel Hunter also had a pretty good game. Shamar Stefan had a sack. Uh, and so, yeah, it's another game where the defensive line, uh, you know, really put it together. And what's interesting is, you know, we take a look at the preseason. We evaluate a lot of things. We're like, well, I don't know if the Vikings offense is going to be aggressive. Yeah, you know, I don't know if the, the offensive line is going to hold up. I'm a little bit worried about Trey Wayne's McKenzie Alexander. A lot of those, you know, they're up, they're up to question, right? They're either, they've either been resolved. The Vikings are indeed aggressive. Or they're up to open questions. We've seen a couple of games the offensive line has done poorly, a couple of games where they've done really well, a couple of games where Trey Wentz has done poorly, a couple of games where he's done well. Uh, Mac Alexander has only been targeted, I think, twice. He hasn't allowed a reception yet. Um, so, you know, that's even stronger of an argument. But the one thing that I think we came out of the preseason with was that defensive line is either the best or second best, depending on, you know, the Seahawks, the best or second best defensive line in the NFL. And they're playing like it. They've played like it through the three games. They played like it in this game. They, they wreaked havoc on that left side. Just fantastic work. Um, and Everson Griffin, I think, spearheaded it. He did a great job creating pressure, adding hits, getting a sack. So another thing that uh, seemed to have happened is we finally got some interceptions. We finally got the ball to, uh, to go our way. And Andrew Sandejo could not have had an easier sack or e- easier, uh, easier interception. Yeah, he had a great interception, um, you know, a little bit thrown to him. Uh, he participated. A little in, bit? <laughs> a little bit thrown to him. Um, J- I, I, I just assumed that he lost a bet, to, or that Jameis lost a bet to him, and so he had to throw one pass his way. <laughs> but he also created an interception for Harrison Smith with, with his hit. Uh, so, you know, credit to him, right? Uh, and and he was he was kind of, you know, laying laying on the wood really thick. Like, he had... I think the second most he tackles. Was, he was all over the field. He was making a difference everywhere he went. Yeah, exactly, right? Um, you had the second most tackles, and I don't think that, I mean, I think one of them, but I don't think most of them were necessarily like bad tackles, right? You give up a passing coverage, then you get the tackle, right? Um, you know, he did a pretty good job, you know, uh, you know, destroying running backs and offensive players, uh, you know, in the passing game and the running game. Uh, yeah, he did a good job. Uh, and, uh, and, and he was responsible for two of the three turnovers in the game. So we have a question that, uh, I'm just going to toss out here instead of in the mailbag. It's, uh, from digital soup who asks who gets your defensive player of the week for the Vikings, Xavier, Everson Griffin, Harrison Smith. And I can't believe I'm saying this Sandejo. I think I have to give it to Sandejo because turnovers are so important. They're so massive. 
And uh, he converted one of the easier ones, but he also created another one entirely through his own effort. Like if Trey Waynes had, you know, you know, hadn't benefited a little bit from an underthrown pass. And again, he created a, a, a small passing window, but for evaluating the difficulty of each set of turnovers. Um, yeah, I, I think that, you know, Anderson Day, Hill created a turnover out of whole cloth. Uh, through his hit, and Eric Hendricks was involved in the hit too, but it was mostly interest in Deho, uh, through his hit, and then also, you know, benefited from, but also converted uh, an interception uh, of his own. Plus, he was pretty good in other aspects of the game. It's not like, you know, he D'Angelo hauled his way into into a good turnover ratio uh, by allowing a bunch, by gambling a bunch and allowing a bunch of receptions. No, he created um, a lot of those. So I, I'm probably going to have to give it to interest in Deho, which is great. Good news, because we know Harrison Smith is good. We know Xavier Rhodes is good. We know Lynn Ball just because we know Everson Griffin is good. If you can continue to get good play from Trey Waynes and Anderson Dejo, I don't know what offense stands a chance. Yes, that's what we like to hear. Uh, let's move on to the mailbag. First question is from, uh, from Joaquin Ortman, who asks, Has any team ever had three quarterbacks with a 100-plus passer rating in one season? This is, of course, assuming that Teddy gets to play this year. Um, and gets a pass rating of what of over a hundred. Also, has any team ever made the playoffs with three quarterbacks? Um, that Arizona team uh, that made the playoffs and then died immediately. Uh, didn't they have four quarterbacks playing for them at one point? Five quarterbacks. There were a lot of quarterbacks on that team. Yeah, a lot of quarterbacks on that team, and too many think, cooks. Like, too, too, <laughs> too too many too cooks. many cooks. Too many uh, cooks. And the Washington team that finished with Doug Williams in the, in the Super Bowl, I think they had three quarterbacks uh, end up throwing passes for them, um, which Doug Williams, is that, that wasn't 91, because um, that, was, that was the Mark Rippon year. Anyway, yeah, uh, yeah so yeah, there were a couple of teams that made three quarterbacks, but I had to look up the, the three quarterbacks, 100-plus passer rating, and I found it. There's a, there actually is one team, with three, only one, with three quarterbacks uh, that, uh, that threw... At least 14 passes, that, that was my cutoff, because 14 passes is one game uh, for a run-heavy offense. Uh, and, and there are three quarterbacks uh, that threw a 100-plus passer rating for the 2003 Tennessee Titans. Uh, so that's that's Air McNair, right? Steve McNair. Mm-hmm. Billy Volick, one of the best backup quarterbacks you know, the NFL has ever seen, played for both the Chargers and the Titans. Uh, and, he, and he retired, I think, after 2004. And like, like I'm not I'm not doing that again. <laughs> right. Yeah. And the Jets tried like signing him and he was like, nope, which good. Good move. Billy Bullock. Uh and Neil O'Donnell, Neil O'Donnell, uh, who uh, ended up playing in the final game, uh, not because uh, the Tennessee Titans had secured a playoff spot, which they had, um, but they were actually playing for seeding because the Indianapolis Colts uh, also went 12 and four that year. And the Indianapolis Colts had lost their game. You know, the Tennessee Titans, if they'd won, uh, would have had the top seed in the AFC. So they were trying to win that game. Um, but uh, Eric McNair had both ankle and, and calf issues that season. Uh, Billy Volek, I believe he had a collarbone injury. I don't remember. Um, but Neil O'Donnell had to play. He threw two touchdowns and an interception, but had a pass rating of 66 point. Six 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 six, mm. and so he ended up getting a pass rating above one, just barely above one hundred, <laughs> like one hundred point four or something like something more like a rock, st- uh, like a rock FM station than uh, than a passer rating at that point. Yeah, well, Steve McNair's was actually one hundred point four, so good call. <laughs> <laughs> well, well then, that's all. I'll... Yeah, Neil Neil O'Donnell's is something like one hundred one. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, next question from Umat. Asks, which one would you take in the draft knowing what you know now? Amari Cooper or Diggs? Well, normally you go, hey, it's got to be Stephon Diggs because Amari Cooper keeps dropping the ball. <laughs> Diggs had three drops in that game. 172 yards. Worth it. Three drops in that game. He just kept on getting targeted. It's one yeah. of those, you know, omelet and broken egg situations. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, I guess I would take Diggs. You know, um, he is a... Uh, Quarterback slash passer adjusted yards per out run is higher. Um, you know, both both Cooper and Diggs benefit from really excellent receivers across from them. So it's not as if, you know, there's a teammate effect going on there. Um, yeah, I, 
I would probably have to take Diggs because I think that I think Cooper's you know he's got more speed, but I think that's about it. You know, Cooper's was really well known coming out of the draft for having just excellent route running and pretty good hands, and he still has pretty good route running. His hands have been an issue. Diggs, you know, despite those drops, his hands over the course of the past three years have been really good, uh, and he makes really difficult catches. Uh, and so I think he makes up for it in a way that I think Cooper doesn't. And Cooper, phenomenal, excellent receiver, right? But I think I'd take Diggs. Next question from Matt Nelson, who asks, why should I believe in the Vikings this season? Why should I trust them with my heart again? I mean... We're winning the games ha- we're supposed to. That's, if you ha- that's a if sign you of a have good to, team. If you have to ask that question, then you're appropriately cynical. You don't <laughs> you don't have to worry about it. You ask the question, you're, I think you're in a good spot. Can, it's the people who just invest fully that you got to worry about when the fall comes. Can can you get appropriately cynical on the back of one of those custom jerseys, or is that too many characters? I think you can find some version of appropriately cynical. <laughs> right? I just want a I just want a jersey that says appropriately cynical on the back of it. Like I will wear that until it is threads. What's what's the number for that jersey? Oh God! You think it's ninety eight? Oh, oh nine, ninety eight. Yeah, oh nine might be better, but you'd have to get the zero. you can't have the night. It has to be ninety eight double digit zero nine. Ninety eight just came out of nowhere. Ninety eight was just like stomach punch, jaw drop, can't function sort of thing. Anybody who knew the the story of Brett Favre knew oh nine was going to end in tears. That, no, that's true, right? Brett Favre threw, I think, the fewest interceptions in his career. Best numbers and, of his entire career. Right, and and now he's playing for the Vikings, so it's not going to end well, right? And, you know, everyone's like, well, a gambler's fallacy. You can't say he's due, but he's a Viking, so he's due to throw an interception. He, he's due to throw it at the worst time. Exactly, and it was going to end everything. I remember watching the 9 uh, championship game, it, it being middle of the fourth quarter, right before that important drive, and uh, right before the pick, and going to the bathroom, not actually going to the bathroom, just like staring at myself in the mirror, getting splashing some water on my face, just going right, right, and just having the moment of realization, like, oh, well, this is going to end in an interception, and then we're not going to get the ball back in overtime. That's exactly what's going to happen. And then I come back, and everyone in the house is is watching it and is freaking out and so upset. And I'm as calm as a Hindu cow at that point, just going, I foresaw all of this. <laughs> <laughs> I had accessed enlightenment. <laughs> I, I, I had, knew for for one brief shining moment, I had complete and total enlightenment. I had complete <laughs> awareness, which uh, so I had that going for me, which which is nice. Hooray! Well, okay, so I think like a fan that wanted to like really obscurely reference something could like like oh four right for forty one donut or uh, or you know seventy five for like the hail mary like. You could. There's a lot of years you could choose. There are a lot of years, but I feel if you're going to be appropriately cynical, you have to go 09. Yeah, well, because that's where that's where the cynicism like does you the best because you had the most reason to be cynical, right? Because that 98 team, 15 and one, right? Mm-hmm. Best offense the NFL had ever seen. That 09 team. I wasn't sold. You on, knew it was easy to see that coming. Yeah, I wasn't sold on the 09 team until the Ravens game and being in there, being there in person for the 49ers uh, throw to Greg Lewis at the end. Like that, that, that appropriately sold me. Okay, I'm in this. I, I'm, I'm fully invested in this. We're gonna, we're gonna go with this. And then knowing full well that it could end at any moment in a terrible, terrible. Terrible crash, fiery crash. Everyone aboard dies. That sort of thing. I think we've answered simple. your question. Yeah. <laughs> I think somewhere in there we answered the question. We're winning the games we're supposed to. Also, someone needs to get us a jersey that says appropriately cynical. That's We, we learned those two things. Uh, next question from, uh, from Matt McKeon, who, uh, uh, who asks, after three weeks of the season... Are there any Super Bowl caliber teams other than the Patriots based on current performance? Oh, that's interesting. Super Bowl caliber. Uh, well, I guess if you're only going with the three games, the Los Angeles Rams? Who knew? The, right. Jared, the Jared Goff 
and Case Keenum quarterback battle last season was really a quarterback battle between the two best quarterbacks in the league. Who knew? Right? I am going to throw Kansas City in there, though. Like, that team currently, based off of what we've seen so far, looks like a Super Bowl team. That team should scare anyone in the AFC right now. Right. Like, until they start losing people to injuries, that team looks scary. And Hunt, yeah. the the moment you think you have him, he's already at, he's already 20 yards past you. Exactly. Uh, there's one of the 3 team, the Atlanta Falcons. I don't feel as worried about them based off of what we saw, just because it seems like there are moments where they've been exposed. They just overcame those moments, and uh, they got pretty lucky in that Detroit game. Um, but yeah, and Chicago I, I, went punch for punch for the with them for at least two and a half uh, quarters in uh, right, and, and, and we still one. don't know like how good that Chicago team is. This is kind of weird, but I, I agree with you that that should give us quite a bit of skepticism on whether or not, based on their current performance, whether or not they're once again Super Bowl capable. But you at least mention them. Yeah. No, it's uh, <clears throat> as far as as far as Super Bowl contenders right now, man, Kansas City looks good, and. Denver is surprising as well. Like that oh, was overwhelmingly good defense. I mean, they got carved apart by Tyrod Taylor. But I mean, again, who who hasn't it, had that happen to them? Yeah, I mean. Exactly right. Ty God, of course, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. <laughs> uh, next question is also from uh, from Matt McKeon, and this is not going to go into politics. It's. We, we are staying away from the from the taking the knee discussion because there's no point to discuss it. Everywhere you could possibly go on any form of media, it's already been discussed. But uh, all, the question is, which is the biggest threat to the NFL's business model going forward? Uh, number one, the product on the field. Two, TV slash cable monopolies. Or three, politics. I think more competitors have entered the market in terms of TV and cable opportunities. YouTube just premiered. Uh, YouTube Live, they they displayed a college football game from what I hear. It went pretty well. Uh, Yahoo continues to to provide coverage of the London game. This is the second year. I thought the Yahoo stream, the technology, I think it went off without a hitch. I didn't notice a single problem. They just need to get a better announcer. And that's agreed. Not a problem, Please. Right? I mean, I, I realize it was the London game, but just you can splurge just a little bit. Right. But like that. The, the ability to provide that technology, I think, is expanding the number of competitors. So it's not just NBC, CBS, Fox, and ABC, you know, with ESPN. Like, So I don't think it's uh, cable monopolies. I don't think that's going to be the biggest problem. And I think that the next contract that the NFL is going to sign is going to be even bigger uh, because of that competition. So, oh, and also, I guess Twitter. I forgot to include them. <laughs> they, they also stream a game, I guess. Um, <laughs> it, it happens. Every once in a while. So product on the field or politics? I would think that the greater short-term hit is politics or whatever, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, what... I mean, and, and, like, the thing is, you know, everyone knows I've got a bunch of, like, lefty friends um, because, you know, what are my political priorities? But, uh, you know, I, I noticed a lot of people were like, oh, wow, I'm watching my first NFL game. So, like, people are countering, like, the boycotts, which are also, like, not happening. I don't think those people are going to stick around that much. I mean, it's going to grow the audience a little bit. Some of those people are going to attach themselves. Uh, probably to the Raiders, because they all, all of them sat, uh, except for Derek Carr. <laughs> um, but, again, that, maybe that's not the game to sell the Raiders on, uh, the one where they bungled against Washington. Yeah. Plus, I don't know, a bunch of lefties watching Washington Redskins win is going to sell you on... <laughs> On, uh, on on football, so CBS, I don't think CBS did report that they had an increase of what four four is that four percent or ten percent uh, for uh, uh, for this week's games as opposed to last uh, last year's games. Yeah, I uh, think it was a ten percent increase over last year's games, and the pregame show got a thirty three percent increase. Yeah, everybody's they, waiting to see the uh, everybody's yeah, waiting to see the response. Yeah, to see what happens. I think next week that's going to drop off. People are still going to wait to see what happens, but I think next week's going to drop off. I don't think that. The support is as persistent. But I think, you know, if some of those people are following through on the boycott. You know, that might be an issue. Um, I don't think it's a very big threat, though, because... Uh, so there's... There, I mean, there's a survey put out. Uh, Rovell tweeted it out. ESPN tweeted it out. And they mischaracterized the survey. So it said, 
Uh, 26% of people surveyed said that they had watched less football. 12% of those people said that they did it because of of the of the boy, of, of protesting boycotts, right? Uh, that sounds bad. That's only 3%. And if you take a look at the survey, more people said that they had watched the NFL than uh, that they would watched more NFL games. Uh, and, and, and fewer people said that they watched fewer NFL games. The issue is that the total amount of time last year fell. I think some of that has to do with the red zone. I think some of that has to do with you have a game on Thursday, you have a game on Sunday, you've got a game on Monday. Uh, so I, I, I At think some that, point like, it feels like oversaturation. without right. And maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but it feels like, God, I have to do something or something else. Plus, the Thursday night games are notoriously bad or they're right. terrible matchups and all those, right. you, you find yourself watching a Jags game on a Thursday. And that brings me to, I think, the third answer, which I think is the most likely. It's the product on the field. Uh, I don't think the NFL is under a significant threat. Again, ratings just went up. It's not an election year. It's going to help things. Um, but I think if there is a threat, it's going to be that. And that, I think, is related to the concussion thing. I think it's related to the fact that offensive lines are getting worse. I think it's related. And which, by the way, passing numbers are still up. So it's not as if, you know, we're like, I think like uh, passing numbers are not as good as they were in 2016 or 2015. But we're like, we're back to 2012. Oh, God, the stone age of the 2012 passing era. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think that that's a problem, but I think that you've got fewer veterans because people want to retire a little bit early, but more importantly, rookie salary cap teams don't want to pay veterans as much. Uh, and so you've got fewer veterans. I think that's been quantified, uh, and that hurts the product on the field, but I don't think any of those are big. Um, but with, and I think concussions is related to product on the field more than it is related to like politics or another cause. Much but more. I think that's, yeah, I think that's a bigger threat and I don't even think it's that big of a threat. And that's, and that's something to, to expect further down the line. I mean, I've been in discussions, uh, regarding my, uh, my son who is going to grow up to be six foot five, 300 pounds with incredibly broad shoulders. And the question is, Will we let him play football? And yeah, yeah, and that's an open yeah. question that many parents, are, including parents of NFL players, really interesting piece I think published by USA Today about a neuropathologist who has decided to let his son play football, uh, and it's based on his reading of the CTE literature. He makes a really good argument, by the way, that the access to information that we have about concussions and CTE is really poorly framed by the media. And that, uh, and he actually is from, I think, Boston University, but he is not in the Boston University concussion studies program. He really hates the 99% of the players that we studied of CTE because, of course, people who are submitting their brain scans or people whose family members are submitting brain scans suspected, right? That the and so it's a, a an enormously biased sample. Um, but we don't know what the strength of the relationship between the types of concussions caused in football games and CT. And, and so, like, he's actually making a pretty powerful argument that that shouldn't be the case, but it doesn't matter if he is because the overall feeling is that you're putting your son at risk, sons and daughters, if, you know, you're one of the few parents that, that has a daughter playing tackle football, uh, putting them at risk of, uh, uh, of concussions. That's what the feeling is, and that's, you know, reducing the talent pool, it's reducing the interest in watching the game because... And if your kid's playing basketball, you're probably more likely to watch basketball. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Arif and I pimped podcasts that uh, were not uh, Vikings related. They, they could be sports related, but weren't necessarily Vikings. And uh, uh, I just got done listening to the Crime and Sports episode with uh, with Barrett Robbins. And <laughs> if you don't know who Barrett Robbins is, uh, Barrett Robbins was the center the Pro Bowl center for the Raiders who missed the Super Bowl. And Incredible. he he missed the Super Bowl and talked all about what happened to uh, uh, to him and his crazy life. You should really listen to this episode because I bet you didn't know that he got shot in the heart by the police and then he continued his assault on three policemen. Um, <laughs> which is just incredible to think about but uh, what in the world <laughs> he's it's a great episode he just like he he goes nuts but uh in addition to his uh 
clear bipolar tendencies, uh, there was a lot of, uh, of head trauma on there. And like, especially the episodes that involve like centers, like it's like a mini car wreck every time he goes to, he, he pops up. So there's a lot of potential, or there's a lot of potential for, for CTE, for concussions and all these things. And he talks about how he's fairly confident he has, but somewhere between like 10 and 70 concussions in his career. Just like a pretty broad range to estimate, I guess. Yeah, well, <laughs> he's he he also missed the Super Bowl, so yeah, no fair. Yeah, he's he just had this thing for wandering into places and not knowing why he was doing it. So, in any case, um, but yeah, th- that's sort of like the the CTE thing, especially like, has has potential to bring it down far more than than the short term of politics. Although I will say, I do know people that are. Uh, boycotting the league for reasons other than uh, the kneeling, and it's kind of like the the anti kneeling. Like they're they're boycotting the league because of they want to see Colin Kaepernick get a team. Like they'll watch once Colin Kaepernick uh, right. is yeah. yeah is signed. This is like really that's that's the hill you're wanting to die on. All right, yeah. do it. Do what you got to do. Uh, next question. Serious question from Matt McKeon again. Uh, Zimmer seems to be giving Shermer a lot of freedom on offense. Any sign if he's doing that uh, or if he's doing anything different with George Edwards, our defensive coordinator? Uh, The first, I think actually Zimmer's provided a directive to Shermer. I don't know necessarily that he's giving him a lot of freedom so much as guiding him in a direction he wouldn't have gone without that guidance because Zimmer's mentioned a couple of times over the past couple of years He's been frustrated with the direction the offense has been heading, and I think a lot of that has to do with explosive plays and the inability of uh, of the Vikings to sort of open up the game that way. So I actually I don't think he's been giving a lot of freedom to Shermer because Shermer's been given a lot of freedom over the course of his career, except when he was with the Eagles, because of course Chip Kelly. Um, and with that freedom, he has chosen a, a short passing game. Uh, but I think this time he's been given not like you can't do this, you can't do that, but I think he's been given like more guidance than he normally would have. I think Zimmer's actually more involved with the offense than he used to be. So I don't know if I agree necessarily with that framing. As for George Edwards, I do think that George Edwards has a lot more input, um, but I think less input than we thought he was going to have this year. So I think that George Edwards has had a lot of influence on the defense over the past two years. Of course, Zimmer's been involved since 2014. Um, But I think he's gotten a lot more input over the past two years, which is why I think we're seeing a little bit less of the double A-gap look, which has been sort of a Zimmer staple, um, and more sort of a, a variance of things. And I think a lot of that has to do with George Edwards' influence on game planning, coaching, game design, etc. But you know, we didn't get any information, I think, about whether or not Zimmer was calling plays or Edwards is calling plays. I know in the preseason they were experimenting with it. I still think Zimmer's calling plays. But I, I don't know that Edwards has a lot of freedom so much as a lot more input than he used to. Next question is from Hayden, who asks... Hey, how do you guys pronounce Giannis and or is it Antento Antento Kumapo? Antetokounmpo. There, that's Giannis how you pronounce Antetokupo. it. Yeah. yeah, you just have just to do call it. him the Greek freak. Everyone knows who you're talking about. <laughs> he he appreciates it as opposed to the German assassin who hates it. Yeah, he hate, yeah <laughs> he hates the German it. assassin whose name I've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> hates it. Hates it. Uh, next question is from Kyle Slabby, who asks, any notable reasons Weatherly and Lamar, uh, Lamar rather, got snaps other than breathers and experience? I think that Weatherly got snaps because of breathers and experience. Mostly breathers, right? Hunter and, and Robison and, and Griffin had pretty big games and also had to do a lot. Uh, but I think Lamar was in there because of an injury worry that turned out not mattering that much. Um, so, you know, different answers for different ones and speculation from for both for me. But from my understanding, Lemur was in there as a response to uh, a potential injury concern that did not materialize. Uh, Weatherly was in there because you want to give your defensive guys a breather. Uh, next question is also from Kyle, who asks, lastly, what's the meal to make Thursday night to ensure a Packers loss? So the question then is, if you have, if you feature cheese, does that mean you're like eating uh, so that the Packers lose, eating cheese, you know, or is it honoring the Packers? And I think 
it's honoring the Packers. I you need to have a agree. cheese-free meal. Sid, that doesn't mean Sid Davy approved. Exactly, one hundred percent cheese-free. Uh, you uh, you can't. I I don't think that means you have to get like alternate vegan cheese or whatever. That stuff's usually not good. Um, and I think that you want to stay away from products associated with Wisconsin too. So no mm. brats. Uh, to me, I, I would have something that doesn't even touch a meat packing plant, like a nice lobster, be a good Thursday night meal. Wings could be. You know, it's gonna be. It's supposed to be cold up in the frozen tundra on uh, on Thursday. I already know what I'm making, and it manages to qualify for all of your uh, all of your suggestions. I'm gonna be making my homemade tomato basil soup. It's going to be cold out there, just be doing that. And if you squint, it'll look like blood and you just, you're, you're, you know. There you go. Yeah. Uh, I would recommend against honoring Cincinnati. Uh, the food unique to the Cincinnati region includes Skyline Chili. Ah, That's noodles. awful. Noodles. Do not do no. it. Do not do it. Because uh, you need to hate the Packers, but you also have to respect yourself. <laughs> you you don't want to go too far in the other direction and wake up in the morning and go, dear God, what have I done? I right. ate Skyline last night. <laughs> Apologies to our 12 Ohio listeners, including Don from Ohio, who's not Don <laughs> or from Ohio, but we're just going to run with it. Uh, next question is from Nick Olson, who asks, uh, this is a really good one. What elements of the Viking success so far are sustainable uh, slash unsustainable? And what elements of our failures are fixable or hard to fix? Yeah, this is a really good question. I like it a lot. Um, I'm going to have to dig a little bit deeper. But I do think that some of the stuff that's unsustainable uh, includes the success rate of the deep passing plays. I think that's going to tail off and it's still going to be fine because... You want to have those deep passing plays. But it's just, you know, the success rate of those deep passing plays are, are what's giving Stephon Diggs 173 yards and, and Adam Thielen 98 yards. Like, if both receivers are having, like, 90-plus yard games, you have to ask, like, are they the two best receivers in the league and are they being led by a Hall of Fame quarterback? Like, all of those things need to be true. And I think neither of those things are true. Um, but that doesn't mean that they will not continue to put up some pretty good games. So I think that's unsustainable. But I do think that, uh, you know, overall, a more aggressive passing game is sustainable, just generally speaking. I think that, uh, you know, Stefan Diggs's play overall is sustainable insofar as it's going to continue to be positive going forward. Um, you know, I think that, you know, that's, that's going to continue. I think that the run defense, I think it's going to regress. I don't think they're going to continue keeping teams below three yards a carry. But I think it's going to continue being among the best in the league. So the degree to which these elements are performing is probably unsustainable. That these elements will continue being good, I think, is sustainable. And, you know, the Vikings, what's, what's really nice about this is that, you know, last year, you know, we're looking at all these defensive scores, these turnovers, etc. And, uh, and, like, defensive scoring, that's unsustainable. And that turned out to be true, right? The defense was outscoring the offense at certain points in the season. Not sustainable. Damn near the entire season, yeah. Right. Uh, and, uh, and you know, we saw that coming. You know, a lot of people are like, is this unsustainable? And someone was like, well, why can't it be unsustainable? Well, it can't. Uh, <laughs> it turns out eventually pork does go bad. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Right, exactly. Um, but, you know, that's fine, right? The Kind of the opposite's happening. The defense didn't get a turnover until this game. They got, you know, three. Um, but you know, it's not as if the defense is, uh, it's not as if the Vikings are not going to continue to be sort of positive in the turnover margin. I think that overall the Vikings will continue to be positive. Um, maybe not three, but like, you know, plus one, plus two over the course of the season. One of the most interesting things about turnover differential, uh, to me anyway, is that the extremes are unsustainable, right? Like I think that just generally speaking, like, the, the teams that are the top two or three and the teams that are bottom two or three in turnover differential, they'll regress. They will not continue to have, going into the next season or going into the next half season, they'll continue to have such such uh, a poor or great turnover differential. But, generally speaking, being good or being bad in terms of preventing and creating turnovers 
is sustainable. It's just to, to the extremes that it's not. And so I think the Vikings will continue to be good. Uh, I think that the elements that are not working, the uh, the failure elements that will be sustainable or unsustainable, I think the Vikings offensive line will continue to have a lot of work to do. I think even in this game, we saw communication failures between Easton and Elflin. I mean, they're both young, right? I think Easton's in his second year, maybe third year. Uh, Elflin's in his first year. Um, Joe Berger, you know, he's fading, and, and he's put together a good game, he's put together a bad game, and he's put together a whatever game. That's going to fade. Mike Grammer's had an amazing game that's going to fade. Riley Reef, you know, he's going to continue, I think, to be good. Um, so there are elements of offensive line play that I think will be hard to fix uh, and will kind of continue going forward. But, you know, one of the biggest problems the Vikings have had over the past two games are penalties. I don't think those will continue. Over, I think over 2014, 2015, maybe also 2016, the Vikings were the best or second best in the league in, in not having penalties. And this is kind of another thing where penalty differential is usually a product of luck, and you can say a team will regress based off of having an extreme penalty differential. And that's true at the extremes, but I think generally speaking, teams can be consistently good against penalties like the Mike Summer Vikings, and teams can be consistently bad with penalties like you know the, the prior Raiders, right, before uh, Jack Del Rio, before Jack Del Rio arrived. Uh, I mean, those Raiders were consistently bad about getting penalties. So I think those sorts of things will will be fixed just because the Vikings are, are normally so good at not committing penalties. So hopefully I think that answers a lot of the question. Mitchell Kane asks, should I buy a Case Keenum jersey? And I think the only answer to that is only if you're Kyle and or live in the greater Tampa, uh, Tampa area and just want to you know point out to the Bucks that once again, Case Keenum owns your entire county. Yeah. Kyle Seagal, I think, could really use a Case Keaton jersey. I bet he's already can bought we get, it. So. Can we get a GoFundMe together for, for Kyle? Not necessarily <laughs> for, like, the whole hurricane going through his area or anything. Just just to get him the jersey. If everybody t- tips in, like, a dollar, he's going to have the most immaculate Case Keenum jersey to wear all over Tampa. If he, I know Kyle, and I do... He'll want that jersey way more than he'll want clean water. <laughs> more important than food. More important than water. Just Case Keenum all day, every day. Uh, Don from Ohio asks, what is the best bacon-wrapped food item? This question I bet Dusty would be really good at answering. To me, it's got to be an item that doesn't need additional fat. Uh, and it's, or that, that gets its fat or richness from the bacon, Mm -hmm. an item that inherently already has like a sharpness, uh, like an acidity that can cut through the fat a little bit. Uh, so that can be, you know, a lightly packed jalapeno popper, right? With not a ton of sour cream, but a good amount. Uh, and then the rest of the fat comes to the bacon and then the popper itself cuts through. Um, but I actually like it a lot in chocolate items. Or like cookies or something. Because mm. the sweetness and the saltiness tastes really good. Wonder if a bacon wrapped chipper would be interesting. Hmm. Like a like a chocolate covered potato chip or Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. That could be interesting. You know, you you mentioned sour cream, but I I I don't know. The, the I I am a big fan of uh, of jalapeno poppers that are incredibly spicy, uh, but the bacon just adds something real, just just extra to it. Yeah. So yeah. if you if you've got something there and then the the cream cheese is is rocking, then yeah, that that would be good. Uh, next question from Digital Soup asks: With the win yesterday looking more like the Week One win, should we assume the Steelers game was just a product of a late cute quarterback switch, especially since the Steelers got beat by the Bears on Sunday, uh, or do we assume the Bears are the better team, uh, are a better team than we originally thought? I still don't know anything about the Bears. Like, I don't know if that team is like interesting or good because, right? Because, like Mike Lennon, you, there's no way, right? But the Bears have had outlier quarterback performances for, like, years now. And so, like, you just got to be like, well, I don't know, maybe. And then, you know, Mitch Trubisky looked pretty good in the preseason. Like, eventually, they're going to replace Mike Lennon with Mitch Trubisky, and Trubisky's going to look good. Who knows? And this is a Bears team that got trounced by a Bucks team that we destroyed. Yeah, right, like, I mean, the circle of life, yeah. right? <laughs> um, 
But yeah, and you know, they they really, you know, took the Spurs to Atlanta. Um for like, I don't know. For like two and a half, three quarters. Yeah, I don't know. But I, I think it's safe to say that the Vikings game, the two games, are a product of some really interesting outliers that we just discussed, right? Like, I think that penalty problem is not going to continue to be a problem for the Vikings. And that was really the difference in that Steelers game. I think the deep passing that the Vikings were able to get off against um, uh, in this last game against the Bucks, you know, I don't think that's going to continue. And so the Vikings look better than they are against Tampa Bay and look worse than they are against the Steelers. But I do think that Case Keenum's overall performance kind of matches who we thought he was in that game because he had uh, one of the worst passer ratings under pressure for any quarterback, uh, any starting quarterback. And he had the worst uh, passer ratings when kept clean for any starting quarterback. He's a backup quarterback. Those things are going to happen. It just so happened to be that he was pressured way more often than you would have expected. So, you know, he looked worse than, than you know, he is in a normal situation. Um, I don't think this Bucks game shows us, you know, who, how good Case Keenum is. But I do think a lot of that may have been exaggerated by how little preparation Case Keenum had. So I think all of these elements kind of play a role, that there's kind of unsustainable like parts to each of the, the Steelers' loss and the Buccaneers' win, and there are parts that like are easily explainable, like there was only one one week. Because it's not as if Case Keenum is going to throw like a 100-plus passer rating, you know, just because he has another week of preparation. Like, that's absurd. It's clearly because, you know, he's he's the god of Tampa Bay. That man owns Tampa Bay. Uh, next question is from Colin Scott, who asks, uh, this, this is a good question, and I spent a little bit of time trying to think about it. Uh, who's getting cut when uh, when Floyd's suspension is over? Uh, Coley, I believe, has been active for games. I don't believe Rodney Adams has been active for a single game. I'm going to go with Rodney Adams. I mean, like, Coley was active for the first two games, was not active for this game uh, because they wanted to get another person active. Oh, Tremaine Brock. Um, so... I, it's got to be Rodney Adams because they're not going to keep seven receivers. So I'm thinking it's going to be Rodney Adams. Seven might be just a bit more than we need. North Turner did it once with the Chargers. Yeah, it does happen. It it does happen. And, and it has... didn't happen for the whole season, but it does happen. <laughs> I was going to say, I forgot about all the Super Bowl rings that uh, that North Turner, Tur- North <laughs> Turner has. Uh, moving on, uh, Miles Swamy asks, is it fair to characterize the offense as boomer bust? Also, is it fair to consume excellent French fries with ketchup? Uh, I'll answer the second one first. Only interesting ketchups. Um, and you know what? I'm lazy. Sometimes I'll use ketchup. But I think if you've got like a spicy curry ketchup or a mango ketchup, go all out. Fries can be your delivery mechanism for an interesting ketchup. But are you, a, if- are you a dip person or will you put the ketchup on the fries and warm up the ketchup? I'm a dip person. I like the contrast of the cold and the hot. I think that adds to it. See, I, as as time has gone on, as I've gotten older, I have enjoyed putting it on the putting a section of it on the fries at least. To me, just, to me, the fries get soggier that way. I, I'm not. I don't. I don't like that. Then you're just not eating them fast enough, son. You're just not eating them fast enough. Well, okay, that's fair. Hey, people who have like seen me eat or have eaten with me know how slow I am at eating, so like that might actually be true. Are you saying that you sit and talk more than you eat for a while? Yeah, I know it's hard to believe. I'm I'm shocked that somebody who appears on as many radio shows and podcasts as you uh, as you do could possibly have cold food by the time you you know it's time to eat. <laughs> this is yeah. this is my shocked face. I am You're right. I, I'm confused as to how there is gambling going on in this casino. Uh, best fries in the Twin Cities Man, uh, hashtag sponsored, hashtag blue door, but, uh, <laughs> I was always a fan of sensor fries. I thought, uh, fries I'd get out, uh, at, uh, at Joe sensors, either in Egan or, uh, uh or Bloomington. Of, yeah. There's one in Bloomington. It's been so long since I've been to sensors. I don't want to, don't want to include it because, I, you know, it's. I do know that there's uh, the one in Bloomington is still open. I don't know about the one in Egan, yes. but I do know the Bloomington one's still open. And I used to go to the Roseville one all the time when I lived in St. Paul, uh, over in over in the Como Park area. So, I oh, uh, you know what? I would say best chain fry is probably Five Guys. Yeah, not even a question. But yeah, 
but for local stuff, I, I, I'm still, uh, I spent way too much time at sensors to, to think anything else. But yeah, when I, when I go to like a local place, I very rarely order fries. Um, so I don't really have a good, and it's not like a snobby thing. It's just like, I rarely order fries yeah, when, I wouldn't order, when I eat I local. I wouldn't order fries. Fetch me the onion rings. <laughs> 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 I, I'll only when I go to the 112. I'll order fries only if there's truffle oil involved. Otherwise, no. Just, just I'll, I'll just leave. And then you mentioned I did have truffle fries at the Red Stag, and they were really <laughs> insanely good. <laughs> so <laughs> they were fifty percent off. It was like it was like late night, and you know, the, you know, they do that thing where they've only got like four menu items because they didn't, you know, serve. It. So it was it was like pseudo happy. So it's not like I was like. Yeah, so I'll have the truffle fries. I like no, one of five. Options. No, that is exactly what happened. The, exactly <laughs> the way I just spelled it out is exactly how that just went down. I'm exposing really, you for the fry fascist that you are. They were really good, though. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. They're fantastic. Uh, but on to the Vikings related part of that question. Is it fair to characterize the offense as boom or bust? Uh, I would say initially it definitely appears so. And I did also make the argument, hey, those deep passes aren't going to continue keep working. But the running game has had a surprisingly high success rate. I know a lot of people are like looking at Dalvin Cook, seeing him like push off these 30-yard runs, and they're bringing his average up, right? Because like in a lot of games, you know, the first half after yeah, the half is over, his average is like below three yards a carry. And then after the game is over, he's pulled off the 60-yard run. He's got a 30-yard run. His average is like five, right? Oh, he's one of the best running backs in the NFL. He's got a five-yard per carry average. And so you can say, hey, he's he doesn't have as much running. He's not sustainably good because he's not uh, building uh, as much um, as much of those small gains as you want. But he actually is um, because a lot of those short yarded runs happen to occur on like third and short, and they're hurting his average like in the first half. Um, but his success rate is actually still really high. It's one of the top five in the league, and I suspect it'll be even better than like fifth after I, I look at his success rate numbers after this game. So I do think, actually, that the offense has the ability to be consistent and stable. The offense is not going for a ton of 20-plus yard passes on, like, third and five. They're doing that a lot on second down. They're doing a little bit on first down. So I do think that sort of the highlights, uh, that element of the offense is not sustainable. So it feels like it's boomer bust. But I do think the offense is getting a fairly decent amount of yardage. It just so happens that they're turning a bunch of like three-point drives into seven-point drives that maybe will continue to be three-point drives going forward, but will still be a pretty good offense. And even if they are three-point drives, it's still points on the board, and it's still going to end up adding right. up. So, Right. Final question is from Billy Dine, who asks, after three weeks of NFL play and all of the political events, what are your takes on the best things to add to mashed potatoes for comfort food? Great question. Fantastic question. If you had listened to, I think, last year's or the year before, maybe two years ago, the Thanksgiving episode that Dusty and I did, uh, we did tackle a version of this question uh, by talking about what our best side dishes. I believe the question was what our best side dishes was for Thanksgiving. And Dusty had an amazing, you know, I've got my own mashed potato recipe, but Dusty's, I tried it. It's even better than mine. It's so good. Uh, And I ended up combining it with something from the food lab. So this is what you do. You uh, boil the potatoes. This is so ostentatious. Throw a bunch of garlic cloves in there. Throw a bunch of potatoes in there. Boil your potatoes in whipping cream. And then use that whipping cream to mash the potatoes. The garlic is so soft and tender and, like, rounded out and, like, just a part of the mashed potatoes. And you're probably going to end up with a little bit too much cream. That's fine. Spoon it out. Save it. That cream tastes amazing. You can actually use it to make gravy because it's comfort food. You, just, you make it as fattening as possible. Um, <laughs> We're, this, like, this says, yeah, nobody's counting calories on this right now. Right, exactly. Uh, you know, spoon out the gravy. Save it. You can, make the, uh, you can make the mashed potatoes as creamy as you want. I like them pretty creamy but with a little bit of chunk. Um, so, yeah, the... The way the garlic cooks in in the in the cream is way better, uh, and I love roasted garlic. is way better than if you just chop up the garlic or throw garlic powder in there, and it's way better than if you roast it. Yeah, I love roasted garlic. It's way better than if you roast it. Um, but you know, having the garlic in there 
uh, while it's boiling, I think adds like these different elements to the flavor. It's just so friggin' good. Throw a little bit of cayenne pepper just for and not a little bit of kick, of course, but also because it kind of opens up your taste buds a little bit in the same way that salt does a little bit. Uh, and that's gonna and that's gonna help you out. So I think that's good. If you want to add a third flavor dimension, take out half that garlic, roast it, mix it back in. It's so good. Here's my uh, here's my hot take on mashed potatoes. I hate sour cream. I I that's that's quite a take. I like sour cream. This 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 version does not require it. It does not. No. Uh, but I like I like sour cream. That's that's. That's big, man. That's I, really bold. I I don't I just don't like sour cream. It's just not something I enjoy. And the first thought I had was, well, a lot of people put sour cream in there. Ugh. Yep. Yep. <laughs> just can't. And it, I've just never I've just never been okay with it. Just it's just doesn't just not a, it's I don't like it on potatoes. I don't like it on uh, on Mexican food. Like I don't. It's just not something I enjoy. And like. Anything that it could possibly be added to, like we, we do know you have the wrong taste buds because you pour water on cereal. I so. did it once, one time. Such a sin! I can't believe one you. One time. Disgusting. I did. You're it. disgusting. Not even a human. You're not even a disgusting human. You're a disgusting monster. <laughs> no. Oh, big talk from a fry fascist. <laughs> they were half off. <laughs> I just, I'm just not a big, uh, I'm just not big on sour cream. So, what I do to make my mashed potatoes taste delicious. I hate sour cream. Anyway, listen to my food advice. <laughs> so, what I do is, you know, when I when I open up the package of instant potatoes and put it into the pack into the little container, I make sure that there's just a little bit less than the three and a, or less than the four cups of water in there, a little closer to three and a half. That way it's a little chunkier there. It works a little bit better. And afterwards, you can put a little bit of cheese in there. It tastes great. Is that? The, that was that was very highbrow. That was that. That's very highbrow. I, I, yeah. I thought I heard you, you might, have a stroke you, there at the end of that. You, you might have gone over the head to the listeners. That was I don't know if they're I don't know if they're going <laughs> to. We're, we're going to lose listeners probably more on the set on the on the sour cream take than anything else. <laughs> right. The highfalutin. Uh, instant mashed potatoes and sour cream takes. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's good stuff. I do, I do prefer my own, but there, you, you have a four-year-old, and there's only so much cooking you feel like doing in a week. So yeah, that's fair. Oh, that's fair. <laughs> so that is, uh, so that is going to be it for this edition. We will be back later this week with uh, with Dusty Arif and our special guest. Who do we have lined up to talk about uh, uh, to talk about the Lions game? Ty Schalter, uh, who's a Detroit Lions fan. He's written uh, for the Bleacher Report. He's written for the Lions uh, Wire. He's written for a blog that no longer exists, but was really good called Lions in Winter. And currently, I believe, writes for Vice Sports. He's fantastic. Excellent, excellent. Uh, what do you have to plug for uh, for the show? So, you know, James has mentioned it a couple of times in this episode that, you know, there's certainly a political angle to all the football that's happening this week. I'm going to be writing an article about the intersection uh, of sports and politics. Obviously, you know, you're going to be, you could be free to skip it. Like what, what could a reef's political takes possibly be? Um, so, I, you know, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do a podcast with, with Ben Natan for white left podcast. We haven't recorded in a couple of weeks, pretty good time to get back into it. Um, so we're going to do that. Um, but I'm also, I've also got an article on Stefan Diggs lined up. He's a really good receiver. I'm, I'm sure you've heard of him. Uh, and, uh, and eventually I'm going to get a piece up on the Detroit Lions offense if I get enough time, uh, which I suspect I will not, but if I get enough time, I will also do a piece uh, on the offensive line, kind of updating that week one piece where I was like, oh, the offensive line, I'm scared. Uh, you know, should we continue to be scared? You know, that sort of thing. So that's what I have lined up. Um, as far as that political yeah. piece is concerned, uh, is it going to be something that tackles the uh, the kneeling aspect or is it going to be more tackling the points that were brought up by the president that have gone seemingly ignored in the media, like the discussion on uh, the safety of the game versus how it looked in 1975 and how it was more interesting then. <laughs> I mean, like, I'm not going to talk about the impact on ratings. I'm going to talk about the appropriateness uh, of politics and football. Uh, the president's nostalgia for the 1970s 
um, kind of will will kind of be kind of waved to the side because I want to talk about like the first argument about whether or not it's appropriate to even bring politics into into football. Um, I, I think everyone kind of knows my answer, but I, I want to present it in a more cohesive format. You want to prove them wrong by giving them an, giving them something they weren't expecting from a fry fascist. Gotcha. <laughs> Better than a than a water and cereal advocate, man. One time, the kid had pink eye. You were up all. I was up most of the night. It was not fair to oh, judge. Oh, you said it to a sick child. No, it was That's going to be worse. for me. Yeah, it was I as a result. Cereal. He was sleeping in a. Yeah, you have a kid, uh, and and deal with some of this, you know, sleep deprivation crap. Well, I'm I realize, just saying, man. If I have a sick kid, there's no water and cereal mixing going on in my house at all because that kid is going to be the center of my life. Oh, is, I don't know about you, oh, but, you know, for me, my my favorite story of exhaustion, um, it happened in two separate uh, two separate times uh, after being up with the kid for several hours during a uh, during a very long night and then having to uh, go to work in the morning, uh, putting in eye drops because I knew that my eyes looked like Cheech and Chong's like right. roadies. Um <laughs> Putting eye drops in and realizing I still had my glasses on. Wow. <laughs> there, there's a level of uh, parental uh, experience that you just didn't think. Like afterwards, I heard the Xbox uh, uh, level up thing, like the the unlocked achievement sound played in my head. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, so I didn't know that was possible. Um, or my favorite of being exhausted and realizing halfway through a shower I still had my glasses on. Like, that that level of stuff. So, if that sort of thing can happen, water in cereal can accidentally happen. Yeah, and I'm One, sure you'll accidentally pour gasoline in your sick kid's mouth. I mean, like, you, you're exhausted. Anything can happen. He asked for blue juice, and he got blue juice, damn it. All right. <laughs> So that is going to be it for this week's show. If you enjoyed it, if you'd like to help support it, you can do it a number of different ways. You can get a NorseCodePodcast.com. We do have a merch section to buy stickers and, and help donate to the show, either through Patreon at Patreon.com slash NorseCode, or if you go to PayPal.me slash NorseCode. Uh, that is going to be it. So for myself, for Arif, uh, for Dusty, we will see you later this week with our Lions preview. But until then, demand excellence. Demand Norse Code. And we will see you later this week. Norse Code is the largest and only division of Norse Code LLC. You can find Norse Code on the Daily Norseman, SB Nation's Vikings blog at dailynorseman.com. You can also find it on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music Podcasts, or wherever else fine podcasts are aggregated. Our Vikings blogger extraordinaire and generally useful human is Arif Hassan, who can be found on Twitter at Arif Hassan NFL. Our intrepid producer and occasional co-host James Bogachnik can be found on Twitter at Big Mono or curating the official Norse Code Twitter feed at Norse Code DN. I'm your host with a firm grasp of the obvious, Dusty O'Connell, and my name is my handle on Twitter. If you'd like to donate a few bucks to the show, your one-time donation can be made at paypal.me slash Norse Code, or a recurring monthly contribution can be made by visiting patreon.com slash Norse Code. Please visit our website, norsecodepodcast.com, where you'll find links to our Facebook and YouTube pages, along with the episode archive and some other good stuff. And any questions or comments that won't fit in a tweet can be emailed to norsecodepodcast at gmail.com. And on behalf of the entire Norse Code staff, thank you so much for listening. Our formula is this. We go out, we hit people in the mouth. 